course, they, they tag everything in the Middle Eastern markets, you know what I'm saying, Asian markets, et cetera, before they run it this way, just because those are testing markets. They move and adopt quicker than we do, which is crazy considering who we're supposed to be. But, I mean, you know. Who, who are we? Who are we, sir? <laughs> who are we supposed we're, to be? <laughs> well, we're supposed to be the most technological advanced country in the world, but oh, here's the problem. Government and slow adoption rates due to consumerism says, hell, we are. We've been beat by Japan, China, let's see, Germany <laughs> for years. But I mean, hey, we're still the biggest music market. So they decide after they test and verify something works, let's bring it to America and do the real test and see how thick it really gets. Or as Drake would say, you know how sticky it gets. Nice pun. Um, <laughs> but you know, you know, you know, conspiracy Hans is getting ready to jump, but we're not going to do that. All right, we live. <laughs> What's going you on? You got the bucket over there, though. What's going on, everybody? It's your man, Hans Novi, music producer and co-founder of the music production company, Room 380. I'm here with my main man, Urban Ways, project manager and A&R of Room 380. And today, we have a special guest from Los Angeles, now based in Houston, Texas. We kind of switched spots here. Uh, my main man, T. Jizzle, a big business. Y'all give him a round of applause out here, man. Y'all give him a round of applause. What's up, what's up? So... Cause I don't want, cause you know, I don't want to do like some like whole like grand like introduction, like yo, we got this. Like it's my man T Jizzle. <laughs> you guys have seen him, and I don't know he, you've been rocking with me what since damn what episode two or three or hey. something like that. So uh, yeah, I was there since day one, chiming in and you know, kind of monitoring from sidelines. So for so for those uh, so for those that don't know, who are you? Like what's up? What's up? Like who 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 is T Jizzle? Um, actually, I'm not gonna do that to you. I'm I'm not gonna do. It. Let me let me do a proper intro, and then I'm gonna let okay. you talk and anything else. Right. So, I met TJ back. I think when I moved to Houston, so that had to be fall or maybe winter, fall or winter 2011. Uh, probably New Year of 20, 2012 when I moved back to Houston. So this is right after Soul Tree Collective, right after we did all those shows and we got disbanded and I had to move back to Houston because Austin at the time just wasn't the best city for me at that particular time. Um, so also with that, just want to ask Austin for forgiveness. As I mature, I realized that I really didn't take advantage of being in the city. So I'm, I'm, my, my apologies for uh, not appreciating the city for what it was. So uh, I'm not going to talk bad about you guys ever again or never having a basketball team. That's that's not important. Uh, what's important is that you guys are important to the independent culture. Um, so I met T, 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 T Jizzle. Sorry, this is my fault. And I just call him TJ because that's my boy. Yeah. <laughs> Save focus. And so I met T I met TJ. Actually, I think I met TJ right around the time I joined Space City B Battle. And I didn't know who you were. Uh I, I'm, I'm gonna give it a but I didn't like Dan was like, yo, my boy TK, you saw him about you way back in Texas. So I knew about you since 06, actually. Yeah. He was like, yo, my boy, he's a producer, you know. You know, he showed me some things and, you know, I, I wanted to jump on, you know, Fruit of Loops and this like, and third. And I was like, one, who jumps on anything called Fruit of Loops? That sounds weird. And two, I don't know if it was two TJ guys, but he sounds pretty cool. So we finally met and shook hands or whatever. And I didn't know that you were actually Agent O's mentor in regards to production. Is that correct? Yeah. So when he came to you with Fruit of Loops, I was the one that gave it to him. So like I gave him the, the whole, you know, layout rundown, gave him a few sounds, ESTs. And uh so he used to he used to be around when I had sessions. Okay. And you know, and, and basically anybody else close to me that was doing music, I would all, you know, I was always calling people over, it's like, hey, you know, let, let's do this, right? So he'll come in, somebody had a rap, or I'll, I'll be in there making beats with somebody else, or I was in the recording pro process, you know, and he would be there and I would supply him with stuff. Everything I got, he got. When, uh, you know, when, F, when Free Loops transitioned to FL, same thing, you know. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, cause you know, once we grew up, we, we started going different places. He went to 
Texas State. You know, I was out, you know, trying to make whatever happen happen. Mm-hmm. But we'd always link up at some point and then just kind of, you know, catch up and refresh. Like, okay, I got this, this, and this. What you got? And he's like, okay, I got this, this, and this. And, you know, so I, I got a chance to hear him from, you know, his early days and then how he kind of transitioned. And then I want to say about a month or two ago, now, you know, he's in the studio in the warehouse. And I just saw him, you know, right before my eyes, just mastermind. Mm. And, you know, so, you know, I just kind of sat back and looked around like, man, you know, it's, he, he's where I was at doing the same thing. He had like two or three guys in there. I think two, well, one guy was an artist, another guy was a producer, the other guy was just, he's like overall go-getter. But it, it reminded me of that same environment that he used to come around when I was in. Okay. So, you know, I'm like, and ever since then, he just you know, took off. And it was a good sight to see, you know, knowing where he came from. So, all right. <clears throat> so I kind of want to get into that. So one of the the one of the biggest questions we actually I just got this question. Uh, we can actually uh, go there. Um, is so I have two mentors in this business. I have two mentors. I have one that's done some pretty significant things. I have another one that's done some like like real big stuff. And not to take away from either one of their contributions. But the thing that kind of surprised me was the fact that I even had a men- mentor, right? And with that, one of the questions I always get from artists and producers, I just I just had one in my DM uh, today on Twitter. He was like, yo, and it was it was kind of weird in, in a sense because uh, he, I had never met the guy, but he was always like, yo, would you mind being my mentor? Granted, I never met this guy or whatever. And I, and I told him, say, man, I really appreciate it. Um, one, I don't have time, but two, I don't really know who you are, so I can't take you on as a mentor. And three, I don't know what you're looking for, right? So with that being said, the thing that um, always interests me is what what is a, about a person that makes you go, oh, okay, I'm going to mentor this person. So when it came to, oh, what made you go like, nah, I'm going to mentor you because you seem to have it together. Or was it like, what was it that made you go like, nah, come over here, let me show you some stuff. So, you know, obviously the first thing is, is, is the talent, right? But you also gotta have that kind of foresight to see a trajectory with whatever talent they have. Mm-hmm. Right, so like with, uh, like, let's say with, with, with Agent No, right, D, right? He, he, he showed the interest. I gave him stuff because, you know, that, that's how I was going with anybody that, that wanted it or was interested in it. You know, I gave him, hey, you start with this because, you know, I didn't have that start. I had to kind of, I had to get out there and get it. So, you know, I wasn't going to hinder anybody and tell them to do it like do it the way I did it. So everybody who I who wanted, I gave them FL, gave them everything else to need. But the ones that actually came back with something, right, even if, even if it wasn't trash, even if it was trash, right, because everybody asked that first beat that was like, you know, horrible. Yeah. Right. But what what people don't they don't truly take a listen to, it, right? Like they, they hear the cacophony sound, right? Mm-hmm. But they don't hear, okay, he he sequenced it this way. Or what made him, you know, put in his automation, what made him do this drop? What made him decide to use this or that? So like when I listen, right, I actually listen to the music, not just what's playing. And I listen and say, okay, I see what you did there. I see you use this there instead of that. I see you try to EQ this. So, and then if, if they did that without me saying anything, that's where I started to kind of sit down with them like, okay, hey, give this a try. Next meetup, now you have something a bit more structured. So then, you know, now I'm seeing that advancement. Okay, all right, now try a better sound selection. Next meetup, now, you, you know, you went from that trash FL beat to this guy has brass, chopped up a sample, uh, you know, got that clean 808s, you know, whatever the case is. So you just, sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta put a seed out there and see how, you know, see if it grows a little bit, if it grows a lot, if it turns into something completely different, but you, you gotta be able to kind of listen to the small pieces of it and see where the potential is at. Because you're not, you're not listening for somebody to come out their first beat after you gave them, you know, the, what they need you know, listen for it to just be hot just because you know they have some sort of talent. You gotta listen for that that small thing that that can improve and then it builds into something big. So here's my question. 
when it comes to mentorship, I do hear what I can change and what where like I know where I can give suggestions like, hey, try this, try this, try this, and this and the third. And I've heard a wide range of records from stuff that's like, oh, yo, no, you don't need a mentor. You need to go shop this or you need to go pitch this. You're good. What you need to yeah. do is go network. So, wow, that is, we can never hear that again. That would be, you know, hey, you put this down. Let's try, let's start all over and try, try, try again. But that's all based on skill because I know I can get someone from A to Z in regards to like, hey, this is how you go from, picking a dog to this is how you put together uh demos full demos that are mixed and even mastered to go pitch for a k-pop placement i know how yeah. to get you i know how to at least get you there but i can take that from from anybody because i've done it you know and it's, it's all experience so even if yourself is and you know trash is subjective but even if yourself is like really really not that great i know okay cool take this you know this piano off maybe you want to make that the bridge this is where the bridge is and i can you know we've done that mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there's a difference between i know what can change and hearing potential and maybe you know may, maybe need to you need to reemphasize it or maybe i may have missed it but what what qualifies as potential because that could be subjective as well okay so like i said it's a uh, you you have to kind of program your ear and be an audiophile first, right? Because everybody can't just sit there and say, oh, I got the ear for it, and then you just hear whatever it is, because we all know with today's music, potential is just, is easy. Nowadays, they're hitting three keys, a drum loop, and throwing auto-tune on. Right. Right. So, like, it's, it's, it's beyond, it goes beyond hearing the quality of something, right? Uh, it also deals with that particular person, because sometimes they got the talent, they just don't have the vision. Or sometimes they have a vision, they just don't know how to put it in something concrete. So like I said, potential goes past just the actual quality of what you're dealing with. Because I, like I said, I have, uh, and I know somebody right now actually, and I'm not gonna you know, throw any names out there because it, it's, it's a little touchy still. Okay. But this particular producer had, uh, he had, he had a talent, right? He, he almost sounded like Swizz a little bit when it came to music, but what happened was he needed that he needed that, that direction, that vision. And he got traction from, from a particular beat he made that a major artist today picked up and, and you know got it. But because he didn't have the right direction around him, he let this particular track go for like five figures. Okay. Right. This this particular artist who got the track put an even bigger artist on there and it, and it sold. No residuals, nothing. He, he took that five-digit number and that's it. And it's it, it, like, sometimes it'd be stuff like that, you know, like we heard the potential. He just didn't have, like, he, he really needed a mentor because he needed, he needed somebody to kind of sit down with him and say, hey, you know, I see what you're doing, but you might want to try this. Or, you know, hey, they, they're offering you this, but you, you have to really understand that you know, we, we're here to, we're here to big you up. We don't want to tear you down because, you know, if we stick together, we all go. And just based off of, you know, what I heard at the time when it was, when it was, when it was me, you know, I threw, you know, I threw my, my two cents in. I'm like, Hey man, look, just, just, just stick with us, ride it out. But, you know, it was too late. You know, he had to fix in his head that, you know, I, I got to do my own stuff because, you know, I asked for whatever the case was, I asked for this person mentor me and it didn't go my way. So now that turned into a, a huge miss. And like, I, I'd have to tell you guys this off camera, but yeah, like he, it, it still, it still bothers him to this day. It bothers all because, you know, we feel like maybe, you know, you know it's, just like, it's just like you deal with somebody from the streets and you get them out of the street just for them to go back. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody who has that mentorism in them, you're going to take that to heart, especially if you have a good intention for your person also. Yeah. But like I say, sometimes it, it goes past just the sound. It goes to that person as well. And it just so happens that that person wanted a mentor, but wasn't coachable themselves or wasn't, wasn't as receptive as he could have been. And, and it cost him a lot. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, you, you're going to win some, you lose some. 
But you know, after that, I, I took I took a big strong list from that, and I was like, hey, you know, if I'm gonna do this again, if I'm gonna really mentor, especially somebody comes and asks, right? I need to, you know, I need to go hands on right away and kind of, you know, get in there and leave no no room for doubt. There's gonna be disagreements and stuff like that, but they have to believe that I'm all in. Gotcha. So. Let me think about one question. Wait, do you have any questions, man? I, I, I have one, but I'm trying to find a way to articulate it. No, no worries. Correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I'm understanding of the opportunity with the gentleman is he sounds like he might experience what a lot of artists experience with regards to the potential, as in they have the talent, have the potential to go far, but they don't have the right people. In this particular circumstance, it sounds like they didn't have people who understood music business and was willing to give information prior to you interacting with him. And the people that he interacted with prior gave him the impression of being sharp, in which case sounds like he no longer became coachable, more reproached to the situation because he didn't want to deal with anyone who was going to potentially take from him as opposed to feed or sow into him, which is what we deal with a lot in the community in reference of the whole, the game is to be sold, not to be told mentality. Yeah. And see, and part of that, so like I said, I, I kind of came in a little on the later half of the situation, but I was there enough to hear what he had and to, you know, have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, like, hey, you know, let, let's let's iron some stuff out, man, because, you know, I, I see you really have it. You just need, uh, there's, there's other things that you need in there besides just the talent, because we already, we already know it takes more than just one piece of the puzzle to get out here and make something happen. So he, the way he kind of saw it was that, you know, the guys that was already there and then including me, but even though I came in late, they didn't, they didn't get him that opportunity, right? Because someone, you know, he got reached out to by somebody major and he felt, I guess he felt like the people that were already there didn't bring him that opportunity, even though he had everyone's support. <laughs> so it was like, you know, well, I got this major label reaching out to me, you know, and it's hard, you know, it's hard, like, you know, really mean at that point because everyone's telling them, hey, just be a little patient, be a little patient. But, you know, it, it goes back to what I was saying. Sometimes, you know, they don't they don't have it all the way there. And when you're, you know, when you're a starving artist coming up and, you know, you, you're saying that you want this, but then, you know, those people aren't, I guess, bringing that, that, that in, you know, they're not bringing that, hey, they, they might not be shopping him as hard because somebody discovered him, you know, whatever the case was, he felt like he, he can make his own move and do something. And the thing is, is he, they, they gave him that five, that five figure number. And to him, that's what he felt like he was worth at the time. And like I said, it, it, as a mentor or, or, you know, anything like you don't want to feel that whoever you're working with is, is undercutting themselves or their work, no matter how big the number is, you know, just, you gotta, you know, it it it, it sucks that it, that it happened, but it had to, you know, it's something that had to, it had to transpire at that point to better everybody. Yeah. So you know, when, when whenever you miss big like that, you know, you gotta kind of, you can't, you can't take it too hard. You gotta look back and reflect. Okay, what could I have done better? What you know, what 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 where did where did we fail him as a mentor? Because you know, if you're gonna mentor anybody, you, that's gonna be a real thing you gotta deal with. You got you're gonna you're gonna come across failures, and you have to you have to be present through through it all because if, if a failure happens and people start to fall back, you know now you whoever else you work with and then the artist more important the artist is going to take is going to take an even bigger hit because it's going to hit their ego you know everybody you know we all know creatives especially the ones that are like that once the ego is hit it's tough to bounce back from. yeah so you kind of you kind of kind of said a lot so we i'm trying not to go down a deep dark rabbit hole we just started and i know i have a habit of that but I, that's just how my mind works gotcha in regards to so so let me ask this question and then we'll we'll, we'll do some we'll we'll go more like as a mentor do you feel like what do you how do i let me just say this what's the heaviest cost you feel like you paid as a mentor there's probably a better way of asking that question, but what's the heaviest cost you think you paid as a, as a mentor? It sounds like you felt like you didn't do enough. And yeah. you kind of, I guess you kind of, you kind of wear that like, damn, I kind of wish I put you more, more up on game. And 
yeah. you could have made more than five figures, you would probably have a much more bigger career. Oh yeah. Now. <laughs> the the biggest hit was actually that, that same person and, and him completely falling back from music as a whole. Hmm. Right. Like cause because the next time, you know, because I saw him a few years after that and you know he's working a regular nine to five and had just given up on it. Right. And like I said, you know that that's the biggest that's the biggest loss to me is to see somebody with that kind of talent just just you know wipe your hands and give up. So I so so we can that's something I kind of want to touch base on. And I, I we spoke about that offline is we're at the age now where we are starting to see a lot of our friends. What's the word? What's the I'm trying to trying to be Mr. Positive, but we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of people just quit the race. That they're like, hey, I'm mm-hmm. done. I'm I'm not doing this anymore. I've seen posts where a couple of like my, my my homies have like, yo, I'm selling my equipment. I'm done. My wife says she's she's kind of done. Cause that's the thing is a lot of people don't know that for a lot of full-time musicians, producer engineers, as great as it is doing what you love full time, for a lot of people in this business, it's not a lot of money. You are Huh. We don't have to throw figures out there, but like there, there are a lot of people who do not make a lot of money. It's like it's cool, you know, to get get up and do what you want to do. You can have the studio session, you maybe certain pictures and stuff, and, and everything mm-hmm. else. But there is a lot of people. Like I do come across a lot of people who have plaques and recognition. Like they 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 show me the royalty statement. I'm just like, yo, you can go get a nine to five and be straight to than this um yeah i explained to an artist today be careful of the namesake the recognition the association that you see because it does not always equate what you think depending on what your ownership role in that conversation is yeah because i i was i i vividly remember there was one guy he had came off a Grammy nomination, like a big Grammy nomination. And so we went to his apartment. He had just got like a brand new apartment. He got a new Dodge, char- I think it was a Charger or the Challenger, I can't remember. I think it was a Charger. And um, I mean, he got like the Midnight Edition and we went to his apartment. He had like a billboard plaque. He had his Grammy nomination plaque and anything else. He had this nice, he had this nice apartment. And so we're talking and I, we, he, he was showing me like his process in regards to making beats, and I saw this photo like all like these different artists, and I was like, "Yo, you produce for all of them?" He's like, "Nah, I'm pitching records." I said, "Okay, cool. So these folders are so that are demos." So like, "No, these are beats that have set aside for these are." And it was just long, like in in fine, it was like this long thing, and I was like, "How many you get back to?" He was just like one, and I, I I know for a fact I saw at least like forty different like major artists and when he said get back to him that doesn't mean like he's going to get a placement in regards to what you've seen uh tj in working with like these different artists what do you think is one of like the main factors that make people go like okay i'm going to just put this up because we've seen artists uh there we go that fixed that we've seen artists in houston like how like how hubbard right he went in when he announced his retirement. Everybody was like, "Yo, what the heck is going on?" But Kyle Hubbard was like, like the like the you know cool white boy rapper in Houston who opened up for a lot of people and was always at Warehouse Live and always at Fits and stuff like that. And he was like, "Yeah, I'm going to real estate. I'm done." And we've seen this time and time again with different artists and producers. What do you think is making people go like, "Yeah, I'm just going to go wrap this up"? Really, is the is their intentions to start doing music in the first place? Right, at least to that level. Mm. Right, because you know, back in you know, back in the nineties, you know, as, as you know, we all old heads now, so you might as well. Yeah. Back in the nineties, you know. Well, I, well I, I hold on. I was born in eighty six, so I don't know none by no nineties. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know about the nineties, man. <laughs> but uh, you know, even if even if you watch movies from back then, right, it, it all had like premises based on real life things, right? And the thing was. We use rap to get out of the hood, or we use rap to make it big. We use rap for whatever, you know, whatever it was, right? So a lot of the musicians that are doing it, right, their, their intentions had probably most likely been to make it big. So that means that those accomplishments, those plaques, whatever they got, that wasn't their goal. As nice as they might have been, 
their goal was, I, I want to be a millionaire off the music. Mm -hmm. And if they don't hit that, they, they fall back. Not, you know, not seeing that, hey, I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, I know a lot of people that are in the jazz and other types of music, right? That are working nine to fives. Yeah. Because, but but they still doing the music because that's what they're passionate about. They get they do they get paid from it? Yeah. I mean they're not getting a million. They're not getting, you know, they're not millionaires, but they're doing it because that's their intention, is because they're passionate about it. Right. So it's like, okay, I can work this nine to five, I'm happy at this job. I can still spend time with my family. I don't have to go out and tour. And then if I decide to, I can uh I can consult with music, I can I can open up a doll and dudes I can throw stuff out there so you have people that that want it because they want the money you have people that want to be famous and then you have the people who have a genuine passion for it. and the people that want to be famous who want the money are usually ones that quit first mm. because they didn't make it as big as they thought they were I'll take the devil's advocate role on that okay yeah you know what I'm <laughs> so I, res I respect where you're coming from. That's that's definitely a component of it for a lot of artists. But I'll also say from a business standpoint, it's the psychology of it. Because you have to consider when you look at other genres of music in the sense of that passion, how old are those genres of music? Hip hop is still young. Technically, if we look at from the date when it was created to now, we could call it quote unquote, starting to get middle aged. But in the interest of the labels, you know what I'm saying, who commercialize the aspect of music, we're still looking at most artists being signed anywhere between the ages of 16 to 23. That's generally what the labels are looking for. When you consider social media, these artists are getting younger and younger. You got five, six, seven year old, nine, 10 to 13 year old artists. And when these guys are breaking the glass ceiling specifically because they're starting to understand this thing called demographics and then understand the platforms and how to find audiences faster than the people who did not grow with these systems. From a psychological standpoint, an artist is saying at our age bracket, man, I'm not trying to be on social media doing X, Y, and Z. I'm just trying to do my music, et cetera, et cetera. So going through the psychology of what the labels are telling you, and then the huff and puff of the way things are systematically set up, you just effectively get tired. Because even if you do get the plaques, quote unquote, if you're not in a position where you're having that ownership, that royalty title, then the plaques mean nothing. It's quite literally just recognition in the sense of saying, I did this, but financially it's pointless. So you're basically wasting time. And as a family man, your family's like, listen, I can't eat off these plaques no more than I can eat off these degrees. Either they got to make money or you got to stop cutting down these trees. What's happening? You know what I'm saying? So it's like that behavior as the market changes and as circumstances become more digitized, if we, the individuals, don't understand how to transition in those spaces, we're going to quit even if it is our passion. Again, because we're trained in the psychology of this is a young man's game. Jazz, you know what I'm saying? Rock and roll, all of them had their time in the commercial space. Now they still exist, you know what I'm saying, in a commercial space. But when it comes to popular culture music, nine times out of 10 in any racial value, it's hip hop or pop. And those are taught to you as, listen, if you pass 35, man, you're not ready to be in this game. Get out of here, go ahead, hang up and put on your coat. But people don't realize majority of the most famous and rich, well, perceived rich artists in our culture, nine times out of 10 are over 30 at this point. May have potentially yeah. started in their late 20s but they don't paint that conversation to you. It's no different than magazine culture where you have a 35 year old woman who looked like she was 18 because of Photoshop. But we don't know that. We just saw the end result. We see the projection. We see what they want to paint to us. That psychology is dangerous and it's only getting worse because of the way culture is now. Like we said earlier, people are sensitive about any and everything now. So it's only going to get crazy. Well, see, now, the thing with that, though, also, right, because to point out what you said, is mostly hip-hop and pop, right? All, all I'll say was, you know, for the most part, is music your passion. Because, and, and how I speak to this, right, because he said this before, for the longest, hip-hop and rap had been his bread and butter. And then along came dance hall. So had, had he not even entertained the idea of dance hall, right. you know, where, where would he be at right now? So when we talk about people that are quitting music, like the only thing that comes to mind 
it's people doing hip hop rap and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah, though we got the old guys, like let's say you got Pitbull, you know, doing new age EDM. Same thing with T Pain, Akon, and stuff like that. So it's like, if if you really want to do this, there's lane to where you can keep on going. But yeah, people that just that are just hell bent focused on, hey, this is me. And, so, and that's another thing I try to mentor people is like, you gotta try it. This is cool that you, you're good at rap, you're amazing at rap. But you know, if you're going for a longevity game, try crossing over. It's all music at the end of the day. And if I you want, say that this is what you want to do, you gotta get it how you gotta get it. I, that's good. So, sorry, I was jumping the guy. I I want I want to touch base on that. I kinda I kinda want to pick the conversation. There was a video by a guy named Futuristic um that has a whole <laughs> producer community up in arms. Ways already know you, you've seen the video. Um, and you know, when I start moving my arms like this, I, I'm really getting into it. There is a video by artist named Futuristic where he says he will not do 50 50 splits with producers because he's the one that's working the record. He's the one that's taking it to radio. He's the one doing the promo. This is at the third. Kato, Kato on the track recently did an interview with him. I didn't know that, that they were friends, but the interview got people even up in more arms. DJ Payne one said something. A whole bunch of people say, said something. Dig, saying digital was just like, you know, fuck that dude, whatever, right? So, oh man, yeah, like people like really upset with Zoo. Now he was, now he went back. He kind of recanted what he said in this and the third. But I felt like it was so clickbait as far as clickbaiting what he was doing. He, he, was, he was doing it on purpose to get the producer community riled up in the producer community. One thing the producer community is going to do is beef about something. I, I know about four or five beefs that are going on. It's like I know this person. Why are they beefing with that? I could okay. I'm not going to do that. But anyway. <laughs> But you're right. These are only conversations that happen in hip hop. So what I want to do is I want to expound upon an observation and then I want to say why, then I'm going to let y'all have it, all right? During the pandemic, Rivers and I, we hired a business coach that works in the music industry who was going to coach us in building a music production business. Yes, you can actually do this. We did it and it worked, apparently. And this guy usually works with people who are like in pop, who are working country and rock. And so we were like his first like official like hip hop production group that he's going to work with. And so we had these quarterly calls where we we're going to sit down with them and tell them the stuff like, hey, he told us to do these things. We're going to do these things. And then we give them feedback so that way we know how to pivot so we get the most out of this program in regards to hiring him um, to help us build our business. Right. So the first three months, was all about changing our image and the way we present ourselves and getting the website and this that, and the third and this this whole thing. And I was like, isn't this kind of a click funnel? It was like, no, it's not really a click funnel, it's a website. And he had explained that. So the first three journey. months, the first three months was just him literally just trying to get, this was him literally the first three months. That's what everyone does. That's business. This is what we do. No, yep. this is what we do. Yes, we're up front, it's transparency. No, no one's going to ask you that. And I'm just like, you sure? He's just like, and I know it in the back of my mind, it's like, who are you dealing with? <laughs> by month Welcome four or five, journey. by month four or five, we started making money, right? We started making a little traction, his, his, this, that, and the third. We started, you know, and then like my B-Stars page started going off a little bit. And it was like, it was the ebb and flow, whatever. We started making a little money, but we would come back and, and I would, we would have these, these, these calls. And I was like, bruh. I am talking to people who think I'm trying to steal something from them and, and they have like this negative mindset and this and the third. And I, I kept running into this wall. It would kind of look like to my burnout, but I kept running into this wall where I was constantly dealing with artists who in hip hop, who I would get on the phone and just like, you're trying to take something from me. It's just like, take what? I'm just trying to figure out if you even need a producer, you may just need a beat. I'm just trying to figure out if you need a producer. Like, can we just have a conversation? If you're even interested, it's fine. And I kept running into this over and over. And so I will report back to our business coach and tell him, I'll be like, yo, fam, like we're running into this thing. And he would just be like, yeah, God, be honest with you. That's only in hip hop. I said, what do you mean? And he was just like, so I, I told him the price that, and I've said it on here before, I'm not gonna say it again, but I told him the price that we would charge. And he was just like, that's not realistic to make a living. So I was like, what do you mean? He goes, my class charge anywhere from like $5,000 to $15,000 a track. I was like, what? Are you serious? He was just like, 
bro, that's some popping country and rock. I've never heard of someone trying to sell a track for five hundred dollars. He was like, raise you like raise your prices. Who are you talking to? And so I was like, I'm talking to artists. He was just like, you guys need to get into pop. So then I had a real dilemma of what am I going to do, right? Because we're we're making a little money, but we're not really making enough. And so I said, so I looked at the data. And so I was like, well, maybe we should focus on dance, ho dance hall, reggae, and pop and R&B for the time. And the minute we made that shift, we just, it was like, that's all I needed to do? was instead of trying to make trap beats, sorry, I didn't mean to follow, but like, that's all I needed to do is just make this, this this different change. And now when I talk to artists, I, I, I'll I give you an example. And I meet him with an, an artist and his manager. And when I told him my initial price, they looked at me like I was running the scam. They were just like, mm -hmm. that's it? And I was remember like, fuck, are you serious? <laughs> and they didn't go through because they were just like, well, you must not be serious. Like, what do you, what? And so once I understood that, that in hip hop, that's true. It's like when the artist, so there's another guy named Dorian. He's a rap artist. He's really in, in like in pushing out content for independent hip hop artists. But he was just like, no one paid thousands of dollars for tracks. I'm just like, yeah, they do. They do. Our clients, that, that's what our clients pay for. And we have additional, and we provide a lot of value because we want to make sure we get the most out of it. But it's not a hip hop. <laughs> so, is the, okay, let me ask this question and then we'll get back to it. Is this a cultural thing? And is it a cultural thing because the foundation of the culture was a whole bunch of people who didn't have a lot and it coming from a scarcity mindset? React. Yeah. Y'all, y'all go. Y'all, y'all. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely a cultural thing, right? Because like I say, you know, I, I don't know too many people that did dance hall, EDM, or anything else with the intentions of getting out of the hood. I mean, that's just, let's keep it real, right? So Damn. that in, in, in return, right, that means that it made a lot more people from that street level have to do a bit, you know, they had to do a bit more. That's why you got people that were making beats out of their house. Versus where you you have somebody who had like a drummer and all that other stuff, like right? you had you got you got Evil Studio and stuff like that out of or, or you got that mainstream at least when it comes to hip hop and rap because it, it was it was cheap it was easy to get a hold of right I could I could easily get software before I can go get a, a Phantom or anything right, like a that Triton if, and I, all, if, I, yeah. you know, if I don't have the funds. For it. And then all, all I need is knowledge, cadence, and melodies. And then, you know, go spend a hundred dollars on the mic and you whatever else I need. And now I can do hip hop. Whereas everything else takes a bit more, right? Like we're gonna do, let, let's go past dance hall, let's go straight to reggae, right? Right. If yeah. you listen to what instruments go into reggae, yeah. It's hard to replicate that in the yeah, doll. In the doll, yeah. And right, this is so. this is a, a conversation I had with shout out to my man Dre, uh, who, who one of the uh, main producers for VP Records. But this was something that I came across because while I'm sending demos, because I was I was working with Keisha Martin at the time, and we were trying to get some stuff done for like Stripe, the the the, the, the Jamaican beer brand, Red Stripe. And so hey. I was making a demo, and he was like, "Man, that's 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 cool," but. It sounds cold. And I was like, damn, yeah, it does kind of sound cold. Like, no matter, I did the 116, the 116 A swing, the 116 C swing, and all of us. So he was like, nah, fam. He was like, we need to, we need calling. So we, um, we were trying to get in contact with the bass player. We, we had worked with Andy Bassford on another record. Um, and we were trying to call like these big ways because they have a budget to spend and whatever. And we're trying to call these musicians to work with us. And that's the thing about reggae is you're right. It was my first time like directing musicians. Hey, you need to do this. Hey, try this or do this in this octave and stuff like that. And you're right. It's like, oh, that's right. That's why we charge so much is because you're paying no. for full production. I'm going to cut you at the legs on that one. Okay. Because I'm from, I'm from New York. I come from a reggae and dance hall culture. My mother's father's side of the family are straight off the boat. And if you've been to Jamaica, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Love the country, but you'll see a lot of it's impoverished. Right. Way more so than anything you'll ever see in America. You know what I'm saying? So when you start saying come from nothing, 
culturally it doesn't matter because at the end of the day when you think about jazz blue soul a lot of these people came from clothes. nothing yeah you know what i'm saying the difference is the fact that they were musicians they grew up in a culture of actually playing instruments when yeah. we grew up in hip hop it was based on the fact that we grew up on this music and we wanted a way that we could communicate and articulate our beliefs our system over these things called our parents sounds yeah you know what i'm saying so when you start thinking hip hop you talking about was what coming out they were sampling g funk so you talking about sampling disco records you yeah. know what i'm saying we're taking we're taking dj's who are in the club and mcs aren't rappers they're either dj's or they're legitimate people who are just on the mic basically directing the traffic that is migrating in this space making sure people are cool calm and having a great time you know what I'm saying? So we're taking all of these elements from people who came from nothing, the same way people come out of the ghettos in the concept of hip hop or street culture. They came from these same streets. The only difference was we took the shortcut and we never looked back past the shortcut because we came in and said, oh, well, wait, we could do this with the turntable. We then went from the turntable to we can do this with this particular piece of technology, so on and so forth. It handicapped us. Because yeah. in that same sense, while we're stuck sampling, when you consider dealing with a sample, who's making the money? You know what I'm saying? That's the circumstance that you're dealing with. If your record is predominantly that sample, if that person is not alive, you're paying an estate. If that person is alive and if you get it cleared, that's not your record. Not in, is it not in the true entirety sense. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? These people are composition owners. They're songwriters, they're musicians, and we're not talking about session musicians. Now, people argue, well, per copyright, you can only copyright so many things, so as a musician, you can only own so much, but that's not the point. The principle is their name's attached, and because you can make money off of this so many different ways, mm -hmm. of course it's going to cost you. When you, go to, when you go deal with a pop record, yeah, you can, get a, a, you can go get a producer who can basically put on a laptop and cook it up. Or you can say, hmm, I can combine this person along with these people who I can hire for $50 an hour who can actually riff this record for me, put this together, pay them on session rates, being there in the union, give him his credit on the back end, you know, uh, this is his composition to a degree. And then let me go ahead and pay these songwriters real quick. But, you know, I own them. I'm the label. So let me go ahead and take that master real quick. Let me go ahead and give you that on the back end and I'm gonna make this on the front end and then let me get that merch, let me get this, let me get that. By the way, y'all yeah, all will make money at one point or another, but the people who are really gonna make the money are the people who really are writing, the people who really understand what's going on. It doesn't make a difference where you came from, it's the knowledge you gain amongst the journey that you take to arrive. Because at the end of the day, somebody like Jay-Z who came from the hood, ain't no way he became who he became just on the premise of well, I came from nothing, so I had to go get everything. Don't make a difference what you want. You have to understand how to go get it. Jeezy said the exact same thing. The reason why I released my last album and people were calling it trash because I was just getting an album out. I got tired of going in these rooms and saying I'm a hustler, but can't out hustle the people who understand the business. Same thing with Frank Ocean when he dropped the Blonde Project. All of a sudden, here's a visual album. Boom, record extend contract over. Here's my actual agreement called my label, my actual album. You have to know what you're getting into, regardless where you come from. Your culture yeah. will kill you otherwise. But I, I, I think to kind of TJ's point is, one, Jamaicans have like four or five jobs. You know this. Like you from New York. So you, so you but know they, this. But they, got so, 15, but they got 15 of the exact same records. I mean, you got five different artists with the exact same song running yeah, the marketplace. But, but the question is whether or not they have a budget. And I think that's what TJ is trying to get to is like, yeah, they made it in regards to that world. The budgets can be small, the budgets can be big, but there's there's always, at least in my experience, there's always been a budget. There's never been, a, just send me something. I've, I haven't come across that. Ask yourself this, when, when, okay. you, when you say they have four or five jobs in Jamaica, what's the number one moneymaker? Cabs? You're talking about, I'm talking about New York. I'm talking about oh, Brooklyn, Flatbush, okay. East New York, Bushwick. So even, I'm talking even, about even, 
even in that instance, if you have four to five jobs, you have four to five jobs because the defined skill set you have is not making you enough money to not have to work these secondary jobs. Anytime we had to work a half part time is because we needed that extra money. So even when you consider the budget aspect, that's still principal behavior. When we come in and saying, do you have a budget? Isn't the premise of where you get the money. From. But we're kind of get off topic. What we're talking about, I, I get what you're saying. It's, if it's a low level skill, that's fine. But we're talking about they have always had a budget. What TJ is saying is the re- me going from just being a hip hop producer to pivoting to making international music, whatever that is, right? Is <laughs> I'm now I went from people to saying like, "Yo, send me send me a pack of beats." To now I'm dealing with people just like, "Yo, here's my budget. Let's work." And that's that's how they lead the conversation. It's a different culture, and that's what I was saying was in regards to hip hop is as you said before. I can go get I can go get the 99 version of FL and then make a whole bunch of beats and then call myself a producer when I've like you've you've we've had a discussion before where TikTok stars has reached out with like 125,000k plus you know fan base and it is like the budget is like the first thing that they want to talk about. It's like, oh that's cool. I like you, I like your music, cool. Here's a budget. And hip hop is never like that. It just assumed oh, you're part of my team. So we're talking about we're talking about cultural differences. What I was saying was, is the reason why there's a cultural difference is because there's the people coming from a uh, impoverished culture where it's like, this is mine. But yeah, in regards to reggae, you're right. They're coming from impoverished, even below the, the poverty line. Um, they're coming from below the, po- the, the impoverished and poverty line. But when they reach out, there's a budget it may not be the biggest budget but there's a budget so while I, I was asking is why is one different from why is one different from the other it's the skill set when you when you consider all of those points of music and then consider hip-hop what is the one thing that hip-hop did not do that every other culture of music did by default hip-hop did not breed traditional musicianship when you consider jazz, reggae, dance hall, whatever, every last one of these people by default going into the creation of music are musicians. When you talk about hip hop, again, we came from a technological space. In this instance, the DJ using turntables, tape deck sex, recording, cutting, scratching, mixing. So yes, technically it is a a musical instrument in some capacity, That, that can without question be argued. But at the same time, it's not coming from the same trained skill set as a traditional musician as a jazz player as a guitar player who spends those fifteen thousand hours moving in every one of them comes in with that mindset of i gotta go play in on this record i have to call in these people to the studio nine times out of ten and see and but see that that also goes into the original you know conversation we were talking about which is the, the people that are leaving just up and leaving because right and and you know speaking to what you're speaking of right it's hard, it's easier to up and leave music, right? If you're not an actual musician, right? If you can, mm-hmm. if you can rap, you okay. know, you, you have a pen, okay? Right. So who's to say that, you know, I can only use my pen for rap, you know? And so what I was saying was before, it's like nobody, they don't, they've never entertained, or the guys who quit never entertained another lane, right? Because even though you right. can't play an instrument, right? You can mm-hmm. write, that's your instrument right there. You can arrange, exactly. you can mix. Yep. You can write. They don't segue. Yeah, you know, so, but but they don't they don't entertain that. All they see is hip hop. Oh, okay. I, I see what you're saying. So what you're saying is, so so wait, it's kind of what you're saying is because like the five jobs, it's like taxi cab driver, you know, uh waitress, janitor, what's the other common jobs for um <laughs> trash man, trans, trans man, electrician. <laughs> Plumber, yeah. what else? Uh, the dollar cabs, what else? I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think. In my fast food, very common. Fast yeah. food, right? So yeah. you're right. So they're multifaceted. So what you're saying is because they have the mindset of, oh, I have to do these five different things, and then when they transfer to music, they're thinking about doing five different things because that's what they're used to. Is that, is that what you're? Right. Either to- if you can't, if you can't do it, you understand how to find people, and you understand these people effectively have to be paid because you want to be paid doing that respective job but like you said when we deal with people in our culture and we come in with the oh yeah i need a manager 
what's the thing they don't say? Okay, what is it going to cost for me to have a manager? What type of manager do I need? Even when gotcha. it comes to marketing and I need my video out, what type of marketer do you need? It's a generalized concept of I need, but when the shoe gets on the foot and shit gets running, it's a, oh, I'm self-made, I'm self-made, I did this. No, you're not. You had yeah. all of these hired individuals or you had these resumed team members. Someone helped you get where you are because you couldn't do it by yourself. You couldn't segue. You couldn't pivot. You couldn't shoot see, the J yeah. off the flip. Exactly. And that right there is why, you know, being a mentor, like I said, those, those are, you know, they all ties back to what we were talking about originally, right? Mentor, right? So I can't tell you how many times I, I've had, you know, a guy who, who I've started, right? And they all say the same thing. Hey, I got a label. I got a label. You know, they, they draw up a logo. They have mm-hmm. five, 10, you, 15 guys. Oh my with God, them. that was such a bad time in music goodness gracious <laughs> and, but see the thing and, and what i started doing like i said as a mentor right the first guy who told me he was he, he had it on label right i started asking label questions okay all right do you have an a and r you know what i mean if you, if you if you have a label do you have an a and r secretary like like what, who's doing the list? because you can't just say i have a label and the only thing you guys are doing is music and smoking weed and playing xbox right. And, and, and yeah, but at, at that point, when, when I asked him that question, right, that right there is how you also find out their potential. Because the, the guys who really want to do it or to sit back and think about that, right, then, you know, they might take a couple of days from Mexico and say, hey, you know what? I reached out to this guy. This guy's a manager. Uh, I got this person working on PR, social media. So when, when you get that back after asking one question, then it's like, okay, now I know I can move forward with this individual. Right. Take it so, a step further, you know, even what you're saying. Like you think about that term executive producer, because we think about music terms and how interchangeable they are. You go and holler at somebody, yeah, yeah, but he executive produced my album. Be like, oh, where he went and got the money for your album? I need to go talk to him. He 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 know where everything's coming. He's plugging, he's funding. Nah, nah, you know what I'm saying? He did all the be- oh, he produced your album. Yeah, he and executive produced my album. No, player, player, that's even, not what it, I mean. Even even from a logistics standpoint. It's more of like, fam, can you take this thing to the next level? Even if you want to just say that, I would, fine. Because as me, as because I executive like produce Tour Wins albums based on the resource that was given to me, but I knew how to allocate it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, like when, uh, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful to people. Because again, it, it, is, it is just a title, but it, I, it's a real role I take seriously. When you say like, hey, you want me to executive producer? Yeah, I have to go find resources to go get this thing. And I really, I really do mean mm-hmm. it. Like if that album flops, it's on you. I really do right. mean it. But mm-hmm. kind of to what you're saying, T. T. Jizzle, it's more of um, it's a mindset. Like we know that we, we say this time and time and time again on this podcast, which is it's a proper mindset, and we want to put out content to give people a change of mindset. I think at the core of it all when we really get down to it, it goes to that question you said before. It's like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you here? It's, it's, and you run into a lot when you go to like these festivals and these events and then we're in these industry part, not even the industry part, it's just like the regular like open mic joints where you're trying to find like the artists, like the diamond and rough. It's like, you can tell like who is really like serious about this stuff. Like Tyler, the creator said like, the reason why he loved Jada Kiss is like, you can tell he really cares. And that's the thing, that's what's going to separate you. And for those listening, whether you're listening on your DSP or you're watching the replay on video, it's, that is, like, that's the reason why I turned down this particular artist respectfully is you're putting stuff out on SoundCloud. Now I mixed the, the uh, for this particular person, there was no beat, believe it or not. Um, mm-hmm. And then when I asked question, mm-hmm. hey, are you trying to do acapellas or just spoken word? You can't really answer that question, and you're going off, and it's more like, "Hey, be my mentor. Can you give me this? Give me that. Give me third. It's just like, "Well, what are you doing this for?" That what that tells me is, "Hey, I just want. Can you just give me to the next level?" And I told him, I always say this jokingly, but sometimes when people ask me a question like that, it's like, "Yo, what if I steal? Like, what if, what if I really am like a real scam artist? Like, yeah, sure, send me like five hundred fifty bucks, and I can get you in this room." You don't know because on my Instagram, you see all the stuff, you see the studios and where I've been and these plaques and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And that's fine. But when it comes down to it, it's 
it would be re really easy to scam you. And that's why we always put out content, which is like, hey, have a particular reason why you're doing this and learning the business, because when you come to my page, you shouldn't get excited by seeing Grammy, Grammy Award winning, being in you know, New York Weekly, done this, that, and third. That should excite you. That should like, oh, okay, cool, well, let's see what he's done, because I'm okay with an artist who's really talented telling me like, man, you're dope, you've done some great things, but you're not a good fit for my project. I will respect that way more than somebody like, yo, I just want to work with you, please. And it's like, well, have you listened to my catalog? No. It's like, well, why do you want to work with me? And I know what it is, is that you want access to what I have. And that's why mm -hmm. in regards to like what you were saying before, TJ, is like, if you're a musician, you can't turn that off. Like the more I practice the piano and the guitar, like the more, like I'm listening to Money Long's album a couple of days ago. I've been listening to it actually since it came out. And I'm just like, yo, she's really good. And I have a deeper appreciation for those runs and for like those cadences. Cause I hear, it. even when I listen to uh, Jaleel, like this new artist um, that's from Maryland, but he moves here to, he, he's a guy like, if you go on Twitter, he's like the big strong cock diesel black guy that did the backflip on, yeah. on the stage. Okay. Even with his stuff, I hear, I hear his music differently. It's like, oh, I hear the pockets and the cadences is different because I now know a little music theory, I can't turn that off. And I'm like, oh, yo, listen to this. Like I do that, I do that with my wife now. I was like, yo, listen to this. Okay, you hear how you went from this octave here, did she turn falsetto? She's like, yeah, babe, that, that's cool. I'm like, no, you gotta like, I can't turn it off now. So like, that's the thing is like, why are you here? Once you establish why you're here, then everything else becomes easier. You don't have to sit there and be like, man, if, you know, if I don't make it, it's like, it's a journey anyway. And you realize that, like, I, I am all for trying to get full time and get signed and everything else. Please, by all means, push as hard as you possibly can. But if you are really in this for real, you cannot turn that off. Yeah. Yeah. And see that. Well, you, you, so so here's the thing. Right. And here, here's something that's going to sound cheesy and corny. But um, as a mentor and, and like I said, it might be cliche. Right. But. One one thing that always helps is to have like the the test, right? Like think think like last dragon, you know, anything like that. Right? You, you, have, you have to have something. The fortune cookie. You got the uh, I'm sitting there showing, yeah, you gotta have something to make them, you know, to bring them out. Like if you know anybody that has that potential, you gotta have a test, right? It's like I said, it, it sounds cheesy, but that's how you're gonna weed out, you know, who who really has something who doesn't. So hold on, so, like, are you giving them the belt buckle? Hey, you got you got to man. <laughs> and he, he got to look for some dumb going. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but yeah, you know. So like my my thing was, and this was uh, what year is this? When Maybach Music Two came out, right? Ooh, that was, was big. Oh seven. I think that was oh eight, oh eight, oh nine, okay. somewhere around there. Right? I think it was a deeper than rap. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Usual Suspects was on that album. So Maybach Music too, musically, especially as a producer, was you know was it a Justice League did that joint, right? Justice League, yeah. Musically, that beat is is probably easily I guess top ten of all time if you really listen to it. And what I used to do, right? I, I had people like so I had people that were our mentor, and I would just have them listen to that song and tell me does it talk back to me? <laughs> and Without the getting people, hot. So the guys that always fail, right? The first thing they said was, oh man, Lil Wayne had the best first. I'm like, that's how I know they're not listening. Mm -hmm. Because Maybach music had a crescendo throughout the whole beat. Kanye's verse sounded one way. Right. Rick Ross' verse had something different in it. And Wayne's just, you know, like everything, it was a, it was a climax of the song. Mm -hmm. But like, they had to really hear the structure. So when, when, when around that time, I would play that, I'd be like, hey man, Tell me what you hear talking to. And the people that heard it, I'm like, hey, so you got to understand, like, something like this is made as, a, as if it could have been a soundtrack. So like, if you really want to do something, if you really want to do something with your music, go for a soundtrack. Don't just go for this is what's, what's popping right now because you're going to be a right now rapper. You're going to be a right now artist if you're doing what's right now. I'm make not, right now music, but throw in, you got to build it as if you're trying to make a soundtrack. Like, yeah. make a movie with your music. And like I said, and I spoke to him, uh, I spoke about him before, but one of the guys that I've been working with since, 
he was 16. Like I said, his name is Team Stack or TSK. Look him up, uh, you know, look him up. He's over here. Because I, because I mentored him the way that I did, right? Not only, you know, not only I'm not just saying it for monetary reasons or for anything like that, but he's so appreciative to it to where whenever he has an interview, if he goes live, and I, you know what I'm saying, he, he, my, my head, my name pops in his head. And he goes, man, I started out with this guy right here, TJ. Like, and ever since then, you know, he, he showed me this, this, and this. And, you know, in addition to whatever, whatever accolades you get from music, it's always good to have somebody that can speak back to you. Because then that's spreading around, right? Because now you got somebody saying, hey, Hans worked with me at this point, right? He showed me everything. So even though I'm working with a different producer, I, I owe it all to him. Yeah. So now you got other people with talent, right? They're gonna, they're gonna come to you. And, and now, you, let's say you gotta use that same test, weed them out, but it's all gonna be beneficial to the end. Even, even the ones that fail the test, you still give them some feedback. And then, so now, right? Cause that, that can come right back later, it's all karma. So, you know, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to just turn somebody around and say, well, I turned you around because you were horrible, you did this and that. You know, you, you, you know, you send them back with some feedback. They, they might come back one day and bring you some more business. So, no, like, oh, you know, it's all a circle of life. But that, that's one thing, like I say, and, you know, it could just be because of age. It could just be because, you know, I watched a lot of martial arts movies back then. But, you know, you, you know we all learn that if you're going to take that role, have to have a test, right? You can't just give them the game. You can't just say, hey, do this and this is going to happen. You, you're going to have to test your pupils. Yeah. Because, yeah, good character. and one of the other things I did to test them, like I said, way back then, because one of my other things I used to do was battle rap. So at one point, like I said, I had a, I had a room, full of, room full of people who can, you know, who can rap, who can write, who can do whatever. One day I turned the beat on walking there and I started dissing everybody in the room, right? <laughs> and, you know what I'm saying? It, it was fun, but you know, at the same time, it prepared them for something. Because then they knew that, okay, I can't just say stuff, right? I got to, you know, because I would just, I would do it lyrically, right? I, and then I would do it off the head and then it would be whatever's in front of me. So then they realized, oh, there's a whole nother level of, you know, having a pen and, and writing and just saying things, right? You know, because everything would be carefully thought out. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, next time I came in there, everybody's music started to, e started to elevate. But the guy I'm telling you about, Team Stacks Keys, he was the one that, that actually getting radio play. You know, he, he's known locally. He's been able to travel. He's able to make money. He owns businesses, stores, merch, all that. Because he was the one that passed that test and took it to the next level. Nice. So you, you got to have something. You, you, you got to do something besides just give information and see if they receive it. You got you to gotta put them to the test. I like that. And that's, 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 definitely, um, that's definitely something I want to consider. I want to touch base on this one last thing before we bounce. Do we do we, you have yeah. your time? Okay. So y'all know who King Labbox is, right? Labbox produced from 50 Cent, Yolanda Adams. He's like, I, I mean, outside of what, uh, N.O. Joe, uh, Mike Dean, I think Live Box like me. He has in GMB and Sound Mob. He might he might be top five, one of the biggest hip hop producers out of the city of Houston. He was one of the first. If you guys know, yeah, so he's one of the first. I'm, I'm saying this as an artist, but he's one of the first producers to sign a deal with uh, Rock Nation, Houston's own H Town. And so he posted something that I want to read to you guys, and I want you guys to kind of chime in. He posted a day ago. He said, "I'm the most talented producer I know." Not beat maker, producer. We are not the same. Don't ever compare me to any of the guys you know that do music in the, if their resumes and accomplishments don't resemble mine. Fame and follower count got y'all confused. Stop playing with me. Popping my shit for the rest of the year since people feel they can get comfortable with me. Thoughts? He's not wrong. In the yeah. sense that it's, it's just like what we said before. It's like people confuse the concept of followers and fans you know what i'm saying in the sense that it's like when it comes to creativity just because you're popular does not mean that you're the hottest shit in the room it just means that you have an atmosphere that people gravitate to but when it comes to just the pure nature of creating to establishing to executing something that's going to change the lane it might be the person on the other side of the room that nobody's talking to but he's going to climb the ladder that you never saw 
Yeah, yeah, and especially on the whole thing about followers and not fans, right? Because that's another conversation I have with people, like I said, that are trying to make it out of the street to the next level, is that they 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 rely heavy on social media, so they think that everyone that follows them or likes them or that they're a friend of equals, a, you know, a fan and equals money. I'm like, no, a fan is somebody that's going to support, right? Because, I, and I say, and I, I always say this, right? You can have all of these followers or whatever, but how many of them are your family and friends, right? And then when it comes time to supporting, those are usually the, the first two types of people that want the free stuff or the discount. So I'm like, your, your, your fans aren't the people that you know that tell you, hey, your music sound nice. They're the people that you don't know that are asking for more. And then on the, on the whole tip about being a producer and a beat maker, I mean, I've had that same conversation with people like to compare Michael Jackson and Prince. Right, and like, and that's just the type of music conversation I have, and I, and I tell everybody all day. If you're talking about musically, Prince was better. Prince, Prince, Prince was able to do it all and right. And you know, I, I said to and be realistic, a much more extensive catalog than Mike. Goodness gracious, exactly. the man was prolific with his his release. Sheesh. And I, I was like, really, where, where where's Mike without Quincy? And then, right, was it Rod Templeton? Yeah. Yeah, that's so I'm like, but, that's, that's but Prince, yeah, it, it's tricky. Michael without Barry. There's that you, too. You, you know? got that too, yeah. Did that too, but like I said, at the same time, you had Prince, right? Prince is so much of a musician that EA wanted to make a, a game after him, right? When they were doing like Rock Band and Guitar Hero back in the day. And Prince was like, no, I want people to go learn to play the guitar for real, then for you guys to make a game after me. That's how deep Prince was. So I'm like, you know, yeah, there's, there's a difference. You know, yeah, Michael Jackson might have been a big star, pop star, but if you want to talk about as far as a raw musician, you know, Prince hands down. And that's that right there is what, like I said, that's what separates the hip hop culture from everything else. It's like, how many people can you say are, are raw musicians, right? The dangerous part about that is the impact, because if we consider Prince versus Michael, even from a musicianship, yes, Prince was the better musician, but Mike was the better businessman, which is what put him in the yeah. position that he was in. God rest both of their souls. But it, mm -hmm. it's a matter of what, like you said in the beginning, it's what are you coming into this for? Michael fooled everybody with the childlike persona based on how he grew up. But at the end of the day, Mike was a savage. You know, my man yeah. had the Beatles. Like, he had a whole lot yeah. more than that. But he had me, but and, I mean, and, he walked away from his deal owning pretty much everything. Now, now the thing is, so. is that where, 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 where would they both be if they fuse both of those mindsets? And that's another thing that we're missing in hip hop, right? You get that business mindset and that raw musician, and you just put it, work together. Where, 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 you know, where would they both be? Well, you know, where would anybody be at that level? You know, and it's just like how you got Ti, and everybody else saying, "Hey, we, we gave you all the blueprint," right? Mm -hmm. the, the, that literally was the blueprint on how to do business and music along with being an actual musician. And it's like, it's how, how do you stop that? Because that's what the other cultures are doing, right? When you got, you got 80s musicians still touring and they're still millionaires. You know, you got, you know, you got people from country, you, got, you know, like I said, reggae, everything like that. Right. They, they're combining those two things and we just seem like in hip hop, they just seem to miss that mark. And it's like, you got, you got, you either got a superior businessman without like that that supreme musician post where you got a really good musician and there's a business in there, but it's not, he's not really as cohesive, right? And it's like, there's always been uh, somewhere in the market that missed, except for, you know, the the very few who made it to the, to the very top, like right? Playing Kanye and Jay, as in Jay, not the musician, but without, without question, Just one plays. of the most prolific rappers in history. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that too, you know what I'm it's, it's, it's wild, like you said, those missed markers, those missed known ones, is you have Kanye, one of the most incredible musicians, as well as in the sense of just creating music. The man can do just about anything he wants to do when it comes down to it. Exactly. Like I was about to say, you about to say, you about to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, well <laughs> not, 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 not just that. What I, I kind of, kind of want to redirect the kind of, you guys both made like great points. And of course, I'm pretty sure people who watch the replay or listen, they're gonna have arguments in regards about whether Mike or, or Prince was was better. But I wanna argue all day. I don't care. <laughs> Prince all day, they argue. So in regards to that, uh 
what, what are your thoughts on people falling for the the follower count rather than looking at the resumes because I, I did i did tweet say hey that's that, that's a very good point because he's right like i'm trying to say this without i know y'all hate when i do this but i'm trying to say this my mentors have done like fantastic stuff like one mentor created one of the nba theme songs another one worked on a black panther soundtrack right so mm-hmm. but they both have less than a thousand followers like what, what do you like what you, like what do you say that someone that has 150,000 followers but it's like they're still trying to catch up with these guys i say that they, they're intent? missing they're, they're miss, and that because they're missing they're missing out on the business aspect mm-hmm. right because we we can say it all day like you said about the uh, engineers and people who do masters right those guys are probably some of the richest people out there they don't have any followers. Like, when the last time I've seen an engineer or somebody who does mastering, like real mastering with a social media following as big as a rapper or a producer? What's my guy's name? Alex. Uh, I keep mispronouncing your name, but yeah, the French guy that we worked with on Trigger Don's album and a couple other stuff. But yeah, he worked right. on some stuff at Sterling Sound Studio. I think he, let me see, what is Instagram? I think he has less than like 5,000 followers. But yeah. Yeah. Four, because, four Grammys, by the way. All right. Now, now you got to think about that though, right? Is it, is it, we already know the followers isn't giving him that, right? He has a business aspect and a business mindset on what needs to happen. 6,000 know followers. Know to make that happen. Yeah. Right, so it's just that the the openness of the information, right, the social media side of it is, is what's easier to gravitate to. And I want to share, yeah. I want to share, share something real quick just so y'all can, just so people can see. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, I want you to see this. This is my guy. I can't pronounce his last name. My, my fault, Alex. My apologies. You're probably just in my DMs like, what the hell? But I've worked with Alex before on a couple of projects. But Mastering Engineer, three-time Latin Grammy winning, one Grammy. Diamond, which is 10 million plus. Mm-hmm. Multi-platinum, Dolby, Atmos, Mastering Engineer. 6,500 followers. So if we were check to compare... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to check it. I mean, it all really comes down to intent. So when you deal with an engineer, an engineer is someone who works behind the scenes in a functional technical aspect. They have a, how do you say, razor-like focus into what it is that they need to be doing. They don't need the followers. They don't need the popularity. What they need is the people who are focused on that context of popularity. You're engineering the records for the people who want to be Mr. or Mrs. High follower count, because those who have leverage with regards to the follower count can negotiate those marketing circumstances for those brand deals or sponsorships it's all true. about what it is that you're trying to accomplish in the marketplace true but if and if you're an artist and you come across alex mm-hmm. and you're looking at this why wouldn't you take the time to reach out to more than likely if you send him a dm he's probably going to respond back just in regards to networking the reason why i'm bringing this up is a lot of artists say it's hard to network in the business nowadays i'm just like well, who are you trying to reach out to and if you're like trying to reach out to post malone i don't have to look up how many followers post malone have but i'm pretty sure it's a lot so yeah. it's like well who else are you trying to reach out to? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reach out to, who was the other person somebody said? They were trying to reach out to somebody else that's like big in the business. It's just like, this person has millions, millions of followers. And so in regards to what Labbox was saying, um, in regards to his post, right? So it's like, you, it, it, at some point, like I said before, it kind of goes that, back down to what we were saying before, which is why are you, you here? And these guys are very approachable, mind you. Like both my mentors are very approachable. Alex is very, you, I mean, if you're in Brooklyn, you probably walk past him at a grocery store or a cafe or something and you, you didn't know who he was. But yeah, you're looking at, you know, the biggest of the bigs and kind of missing the point. The reason why I want to bring this up is I would like to see more artists take time to really network and go find out like who's the real, who's who. Not just a person that spent money on a publicist to get the name out there. Come most of the, like, Sir Lu- Lucian Grange, right? We all know we we know who that is. If I see Sir Lucian Grange, I'm like, this is the guy that owns 60% of the music market. I know who he is, but does an average artist know that the person that can get them in whatever they ever want ever is walking past them? Then if you don't know who these people are, 
then again, what are you here for? And that's where it kind of goes like, are you looking to be famous or are you looking to really come out here and do something big? And that's it. But uh, but, but you yeah, gotta y'all, y'all, y'all go ahead. I say think, think about it this way. If you're an artist and you see this producer or this engineer, they have these accolades. Most artists, and this, this goes both ways, pause. Most artists will look at that situation and think that, oh, they don't have a low follower account. This could be a scam if you don't fact check this person's information off social media. That's the first thing they don't do because there are a lot of people who are out here doing exactly that. Oh, I'm this artist, or I'm this producer, yada, yada, and it's bullshit. So they need to go back and fact check. That's the first thing. The other issue becomes budget. As we said before, you look at this person who has these certifications, these accolades, and you think, oh, I can't talk to this person without actually saying I got a real pocket because I'm not going to want to waste their time from an average artist standpoint. And then the other situation is psychologically speaking, they're looking at this person saying, well, this person engineered the record for Ariana Grande, the person I want to be. But circumstantially, they got a multi-platinum record because they engineered Ariana Grande's record. They're dope. They use this skill set that they have. That's incredible and tied it in with this individual who had this dope record and these things came together. Who do I want to be on this side of the track? Well, I want to be the Ariana Grande. So let me go network with the people who are getting me in those conversations to be that person. And then this person is going to become accessible to me because I'm who they want to work with in that sense. This is generally how they think about from market viability. They're not looking at it in the sense of from behind the scenes, let me work with this engineer and I'm going to have this super dope record that's going to blow up because they're thinking it's an engineer. He's going to have this incredible skill set and make this incredible record. Yes. But is he about to go shop my record? Is he about to tell everybody my record? Does he have a lawyer that can at least put me on to these labels and they're going to shop my record? If the answer is to know the, all of these things and he's only going to engineer this incredible record for me, then I need to go on the other side of this track and meet the people who are going to shop this information and find an engineer who's going to do the exact same thing, but at a better budget price and spend the majority of my money in the marketing scale, finding ways to get this conversation out so I can be who I want to be. So these engineers will come to me because my team will throw out the cast and say, hey, such and such needs this. Reel it on in. That's how they look at those situations, psychologically speaking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You pretty, like you, pretty much, you pretty much killed it. <laughs> That's what I was saying. You pretty much killed it. Um, man, TJ, I really appreciate you um, jumping on. Like I said, as always, I really appreciate the, the support you've given us um, for the past 38 episodes because this is episode 40. So we're 10 up, episodes man. away from hitting a, a, a milestone, but this Turn is what. Yeah, but this is like what we love to do is is like really speak on the experiences and the reason why I, and I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a tangent. Just warning you guys, but I don't want to say why I'm, I'm going on a tangent and then we'll wrap this up. The biggest conversation now, in regards to podcasts, is one. What I'm really proud of, of us um, not doing is bashing women because that really is like a thing. Is it's I I believe and I could be wrong, oh, wow. that the lanes from high school from pre-workout on Wi-Fi and decided to start a podcast. I feel like that's what's really happening. So that's the reason why we're seeing so much is these are these are, these are are the guys that we want in high school. You, you went, no. And they decided to start their own culture, right? And like I'm, a, I'm an alpha male. It's like, you're an alpha male. You don't have to tell us, but whatever. Mm-hmm. With that being said, there is a lot of content out with artists and a lot of pack podcasts are saying like the information that's being given to artists it's all theories and you can tell because it's always like y'all need to you need to you should be and what i like about us is that we focus mm-hmm. more like this is what i did waves like hey i had an internship at bet this is what i learned this is what i did this is how i work with this artist hey i worked on this album i did this i got this i was at all dev da, 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 da. i did this this is what might be able to help you Right. So that's why I was asking those very poignant questions, which is what did you do? So in regards to the mentorship, that's why I was kind of focusing on that is because that's what I feel like is going to separate us from everyone else in the long run is people are now catching on like, 
you guys are just saying, saying theories. I have reached out to at least over 500 different artists. So I know how to have a conversation with an artist. Despite the fact that I used to be an artist, I know how to talk to artists. I can tell immediately from the first three seconds of speaking with, with an artist where they're coming from and what their experiences are. And I try to translate that into this podcast. And the thing that I really am proud of us doing in regards to this platform is giving practical advice. This is what worked. This is what not worked. This was the funny thing about it. Like the whole thing about the situation with the manager and the artist that got into a fist fight in Miami. That was a real experience. And I really suffered for it. I had nothing to do with it, but that really happened. That's not a theory. And so based on that, this is how I reacted. This is how I would change it going back. I try to remain as professional as possible, but at the same time, full-time music producer, and I was kind of getting upset because it's messing with my money. And that's how I handled it. And that's a real life situation. So TJ, in regards to that, really appreciate you coming on. Really appreciate you giving your insight and sharing the story of, hey, this is what happened with me while working with this kid as a mentor. This is how this has affected me in the long run and stuff like that. Today, we'll make a change, but six weeks from now, six months from now, or six years from now, there's going to be a producer who's going to be like, man, I need a mentor. They're going to come across this episode go, oh, okay, that's what I need to look out for. And they're going to pivot because they have a different lens and go, oh, okay, cool. So the person I'm looking up to really ain't really about this because he's not asking these, or he's not exercising this stuff, right? The philosophy yeah. won't change. The, the task may change and the dawn of technology may change, but the philosophy it won't change. So for that, really appreciate it. Waves as always, man. Give your two cents so we, we can wrap this up and everyone can go enjoy their week. Most definitely, man. Let's tell people keep it thugging, keep it realistic, stay studying, stay focused, get your information how you live, and get to that money. It's all about the music in the business. Yes, sir. All right. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in. Uh T TJ, we definitely appreciate it, man. Again. Y'all have a great week. Keep asking those questions. Keep looking for practical knowledge, not theories, because there are a lot of us who are actually out here on our on our old toes, ten toes doing this. Some of us have been, you know, blacklisted on email lists. I haven't, but <laughs> Theo knows who I'm talking about. But shit like that happens. But so let's let's let us continue to give you the knowledge so you don't run into those um, you know, those uh, those bad things. And um, yeah, man, we appreciate it. Much love and deuce. Amen. Peace.